Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. You can open your a camera and you can unmute yourself. Um, so very happy to meet everybody. So I'm Chava, Chava Siegelman. And um, this is really our first meeting online. So very happy. Um, we thought about the idea that we'll have once in a while some kind of a program, some people that can give us interesting uh, talk. And uh, today we have uh, Pnina. So since we have we are, uh, a small number of people, maybe uh, if you want just to introduce yourself, maybe, you know, may, let me first introduce Pnina. And then uh, we can go around to introduce yourself and then we'll start with the talk. So Pnina is actually a historian of science who published widely on women in science, public memory, science funding, and especially on the history of molecular biology. Her talk today combines all these dimensions while also adding more recent topics, that of epistemic justice for women sci scientists, including women of color. Pnina lectured in many world regions, including the Americas, Asia, and the Middle East and Europe. And since 2007, she has been a resident scholar at Brandeis University's WSRC. It's a women's studies research center. Um, I think that uh, I have here an addition that two days every week, she takes care of her two charming toddler grandkids. So I never met uh, Penina's grandkids, but I met her daughter before she was a medical doctor when she was young and very pretty and, and charming little girl. So I met Penina long ago. I was very impressed. At the time, it was not as common to do research on women in science. It was not something that I ever heard about. And she was telling me stories that I was getting shivering to hear about how you, what you needed to do to, to be credited. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very, just very happy to have her here. Thank you, Prina, for coming. Thank you. Um, and would you feel comfortable because we're just eight of us or nine of us, would you feel comfortable if we go around the room just for a short introduction between us? It's like an opportunity to know each other that's the first meeting so we're the first seed sure one, one of the people in the room is a real expert on on race so go ahead okay who wants to be the first gail sure <laughs> hi i'm gail carpenter so Gerd is one of the uh she did a lot of work in neural networks before many of us. And I think, weren't you the first INNS woman fellow? Uh, yes. And also uh, the uh, IEEE neural networks pioneer. I think I'm the only woman out no, of no. dozens of. You but, should work hard to get more women into that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So Gail's husband is very famous and, and very, very good scientists. You know, both of them are in neural networks. I think you had some papers together and many separate, you know. Yeah. Some but when I was separate. starting in the early 70s, our whole field was about as many as there are now. So I guess that's progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is, thank you, Gail. And just on my on my screen, the next person, just with the random order that I guess I'm getting it, I have Nestle Han. Yeah, that's me, Nestle Han, Serap Şengör. I am from Turkey, from Istanbul Technical University. Uh, actually, I was the first to get PhD in my. Um, subject in uh, Istanbul Technical University as a woman. Ah. It's, it's been now more than 36 years, but I'm a professor now working on uh, computational neuroscience mostly. And it's nice to meet you all here. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. It's really kind of wonderful to start our 
you know, group. And I'm, I'm actually happy that we start small and we'll grow from the seed. It's, then we get a chance to know each other. My next one is actually Kenneth Manning. Yes, I'm Kenneth Manning. I'm a professor of the history of science at MIT and an old friend of Panina's. Ah, okay. Great. I'm happy to have you here. Are you related to the Manning that gave money to UMass Amherst Computer Science? Anybody who has money is unrelated to me. <laughs> <laughs> so my school is now called the school, Manning School of Computer Science. <laughs> so you don't claim it. <laughs> no, no, I wish I could, but I, but it's not me. <laughs> Thank you. I have the next one is um, Mary Virginia Orna. Hello, Panina. I believe we met when I was on sabbatical uh, in Israel. And it's so nice to see you again. I'm glad you're at Brandeis. And Mary, what's your field? Oh, uh, I'm a chemist. Chemist. Oh, that's beautiful. And where, where do you work? You see the periodic table in my background. I see that. You're right. And you're in Boston also? No, I, in New York. In New York. Okay, nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us. So I have... forgot to say that she is now in Abu Dhabi. No, no, I just flew back and oh, our, I just good. arrived. I rushed in and I arrived then just now. Good. So yeah, it was a few years, days in Abu Dhabi now in Tel Aviv. I just arrived to Tel Aviv, rain to have this meeting and I'm continuing to Massachusetts. So uh, we have Mary, you just opened the camera perfectly. Yeah, hi. I'm in New Mexico and I have a very unstable internet, so my green screen isn't working. But hi, Panina. Panita and I collaborated on some history of science years ago at UC Berkeley. And I'm actually just a retired chemist. I'm not a historian of science, but I did some research that was wonderful with Panina. And we've been friends ever since. Sorry about my connection. I'm going to just go on audio, but I'm here. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Well, you should know that Mary is not a just. <laughs> she was the first successful plaintiff to take on a national laboratory lack of wage gap for women. Wow. Uh, in a collective su uh, suit. So Mary is, I'm uh, most proud that she once was my student. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Penina. Uh, Wonderful. Then we have Judy. I think you're muted, Judy. Uh, hi, I'm Judy Pinolis, and I I'm know Panina from when I worked at Brandeis. I retired from Brandeis, worked there as a librarian, and I worked with Panina at Brandeis. Wow. Okay. Panina, it's wonderful. You have so many friends. <laughs> and many yeah. more that are not here, but anyway. That's wonderful. Uh, the next one is Jane. Um, I'm here, but I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, we see you and you have beautiful hairdo. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm Jane Gitcher. I am a retired professor in the University of California in San Francisco. And um, I spent 10 years um, as the editor of interviews for a um, journal called Pub um, PLOS Genetics, Public Library of Science Genetics. Yeah. And I'm interested in discovery. How do people, what are the things that um, gel to cause discovery in in my field, genetics. I, I'm a human geneticist. And so um, anyway, I've 
actually interviewed a lot of the people on this particular topic that's being covered today. So I'm just interested in it in general. Thank you very much for including me. No, that's wonderful. Very and welcome. I, I think I have the next one, you tend. It's probably uh, short. Yeah, one moment. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Ignazio Arrabito. I'm a little bit out of place here. I'm just a student from Professor Mauro Capocci, who knows Nina. And the thing is, I did a thesis in uh, the history of biophysics. During that thesis, I read one of Nina Abiran uh, art. Uh, it was the deconstructing the historiography of molecular biology, the one where she talks about uh, all this text and how, well, she does a pretty interesting uh, historiographical critic. Uh, I just loved that article, so my, yeah, Professor Capocci just invited me to this meeting. And yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel really lucky to be inside it. That's wonderful. Thank you. I have the next Santina, Romeo. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I came from Italy and uh, yeah, I'm a computer engineering student. Uh, actually, I'm preparing uh, my thesis uh, about uh, the images from uh, space. Uh, for example, I made this from Mars, okay? And uh, in fact, uh, I was invited by my professor to participate to participate in this event. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And I see Marley. Marley, hey, I didn't see you since July. Yes. How are I you? Fine and you. So Marley, I believe, are you still our president? No, I'm not the president. I am the secretary of the society. The president was was Christina, and now is Danilo. Okay, and you are the the, the secretary. secretary, yes, of the society. So I am a professor at the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and I have been uh, working with within the society for many years. As Haba said, I am the current secretary. And I work with artificial neural networks, uh, also with other techniques from the computation intelligence like fuzzy and evolutionary. And my main research area at the moment is hybrid systems, neural architecture search, and explainable AI. Nice to see you all. Good field. Thank Marty, you. I have a you that after we met in July in the conference, I came back to United States with COVID. I was oh, off really? three weeks. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now I was lucky. <laughs> I was yeah, I think I caught it on the way because there are lots of coughing people on the flight yes, to Boston. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I think I did I forget anybody because my my screen has rearranged itself, but I think it's everybody. So I'm really, really looking to forward to hear Pnina. So, Penina, the stage is yours. Oh, and Katie, how did I do that? Katie, you have to open your camera. Katie is, is without Katie, nothing in the INNS will be happening. So, in particular, in everything. Ah. So, thank you so much for supporting us for the, in general, and the women uh, section in particular. You're very kind, Hava. Yes, I'm uh, the INNS operations manager, and it is my pleasure to facilitate this talk and many other INNS events. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just muting myself just to make it clear, and let's go. Uh, thank you, uh, Hava, Kathy, and the society for inviting me. Um, I must start with um, a sad announcement that one of my closest colleagues, Nancy Slack, just died at age 92 with her boots on, uh, planning to do a cross-country trip. So all of us who, who knew her uh, understand how big this loss is. And uh, 
our thoughts are with, with the family. She was my co-editor for the volume Creative Couples in the Sciences. And she did a lot of other things. She was a botanist, ecologist, teacher, and uh, historian of science, of course. So Nancy Slack, uh, 92. Um, my talk today is about uh, uh, discovering history in science that uh, presents one of the biggest contrasts in uh, recognition of women or lack of it. Uh, it is well known that uh, women, uh, minorities, foreigners, uh, usually get less recognition than they're supposed to. But in this case, the contrast is so impressive that I thought it deserves a special talk, uh, uh, not just a talk, a book. Uh, so what I want to do today is to say a bit about the historical context. We talk about the discoveries that took place in the late 1970s, to say a few things about its scientific features. Um, and uh, since I saw that all of you are very articulate, uh, we should discuss what I hope to learn from you, namely how we can help restore epistemic and social justice in this case, which means that people who made the discovery are recognized and uh, those who are recognized without making it, uh, others may decide what to do with them. But I'm particularly interested in our options for uh, restoring justice to those invisible women scientists. So um, the 1970s, I understand that some of you were around at that time, uh, uh, as was I. Um, it's a decade that had uh, bad publicity. It's not as exciting as the 1960s <laughs> and not as narcissistic as the 1980s, the me decade. Uh, not me too, me. And uh, uh, what is important from the perspective of, from our perspective is that it's actually a very important decade for women, which may be why it is considered unimportant <laughs> by political scientists and others. So what happens in the 1970s? We have the war of cancer, uh, which means that uh, a lot of money is authorized by Congress. And uh, new research centers are created, and all of them, or most of them, uh, play the key role in this discovery. Um, another event in 1970s, the affirmative action legislation, which expanded the presence of women, as you know, in higher education, employment, sports, science, and technology. Um, the situation in the late 70s is not like in the late 60s or 50s. Uh, women are flocking to science. Uh, it's impossible not to mention the Roe versus Wade that certainly gave more freedom um, to women to uh, engage in careers. And uh, 1975, you, you have United Nations declaring a whole decade uh, which was extended later for another decade to promote women's global sta status, which means that the status was so bad that it had to be specially promoted. And in 1977, uh, it's a peak of the women liberation movement because uh, 20,000 participants attended a national conference in Texas, including the US first ladies and other celebrities. So uh, people who, has, who haven't heard by, uh, at that time, who hadn't heard of uh, the movement, uh, were able to see it in, uh, the, at that time. Now, uh, what is the discovery of RNA splicing? Essentially, 
the discovery uh, replaced the paradigm of collinearity, which was a pillar of molecular biology and meant that uh, messenger RNA and the proteins that are made uh, on its basis are collinear with the genome, with DNA, uh, uh, as prescribed by the genetic code. Now, the discovery uh, revealed that actually messenger RNA is not collinear with DNA, but is a product of alternatively spliced non-contiguous segments of the high nuclear RNA transcript, which is collinear. But this is not what plays a functional role in uh, the cell. Now, for various reasons, the proof of the discovery at that time was considered to be a combination of very, very recent uh, technologies, uh, foremost among them RNA-DNA hybridization and electron microscopy. Um, the discovery has major ramification for explaining biological diversity. Uh, for example, it explains why you don't need so many genes because you have alternative splicing. And also that genes are split into exons and introns or coding and non-coding segments. Uh, it's considered the third most important discovery in molecular biology. At the time, five teams claimed the discovery. And you can see in chronological order, uh, where, when, and uh, when each team published, and uh, where did they come from? So uh, we have here about half a dozen research institutes, and um, what you need to remember for the purpose of the talk today, that uh, only two, uh, re uh, only two teams. Uh, had what was called the discovery proof. And therefore, uh, as I, I will say soon, both the Nobel Prize and the recognition by citation went to the top two teams and not to the bottom three. It's a big question whether uh, this was right because you don't need that proof for the discovery, but at the time people accepted only that proof. But we'll not talk about it today. Uh, so as I said, there are a few issues of recognition. Only two teams are cited, even though there are others that also observe the phenomenon. The mRNA uh, is composed of uh, segments coded in a non-contiguous manner, uh, from non-contiguous origins of the genome. Now, uh, in 1993, or what, what would be that, uh, 16 years later, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, two co-authors. Can, can, can you put again the dates, the previous Right, the so discovery was made in 1977. June and September, August. September. Uh, well, uh, it was published in August and September, and uh, the other teams published later, uh, but also in 1977. And everybody who published in 1977 okay. may be considered a potential discoverer. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, in 1993, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, two co authors out of uh, seven oh, who. Yeah. Um, uh, were members of the two teams, which, as I pu put in red, mm -hmm. they had what was accepted as a discovery proof, namely mm -hmm. uh, loopsing on the uh, electron microscope, even mm -hmm. though they are not absolutely necessary. But this is the game, and I'm not discussing today what to do with the other teams. Um, there are other problems with this discovery. For example, the Nobel justification asserts that the two 
laureates, one from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and one from Cancer Research Center at MIT, uh, made the discovery independently. But the laureates denied it. And uh, there is evidence that uh, this independence is some kind of social construct uh, designed to make peace in the scientific community, but I will not uh, say more about it because to deal with the topic, you really need to be a historian of science and not all the audiences in that category. And uh, it, it's a complex issue. But we so, all know what it means that somebody's copy your paper in an intelligent way. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, the laureate himself denies that this is independent, so it, it, it's uh, complicated. But what concerns us today is number four in the two teams that uh, were recognized with the Nobel Prize. Uh, none of the women co-authors uh, received any recognition. And this is strange because three of the six women who were co-authors of papers on the discovery were lead co-authors. And uh, it is known that lead co-authors, there are some exceptions, but I investigated this case. And in this case, they were really responsible for, pr primarily responsible for the paper. So you can see here the six women, and uh, you have uh, at the bottom center the two women from the T uh, from the Cancer Research Center at MIT, and uh, you have on the left two women from uh, two different teams from the Weizmann Institute, and. Uh, on the right, you have two women from uh, Cold Spring Harbor. And I'm going to focus today. I've written on all six, and you're welcome to look at the literature. Uh, but today, we're going to talk on the two women on the right, because it's uh, these women present us with a possibility to look on at the intersection of gender and race, while the other four don't present this possibility. Now, uh, as I said, the, the six women come from three institutions, which is essentially uh, Cold Spring Har Harbor, MIT, and the Weizmann Institute. Now, uh, what's the problem here is the recognition. The women are, uh, prior to my starting an NSF-sponsored project on this discovery about four years ago, uh, they were totally unknown. And the uh, anniversaries of the discoveries were celebrated without them being invited. Their first, they are the lead authors, two of them. Now, um, we are now almost half a century later. Most people don't know nothing about them. Uh, in addition, uh, as I said, there is ongoing marginalization. Uh, if they have an anniversary, for example, they had the 40th anniversary because uh, historians were already on the ground. They gave them a few minutes, but other people took uh, 20 minutes. So um, in addition, there is a problem of uh, some kind of character assassination. When I began my study, I talked to, uh, I interviewed uh, all the co-authors, uh, whether they received the Nobel or not, uh, most of them didn't. And uh, uh, some of their colleagues. And there are many, uh, whether uh, colleagues of the uh, laureate, administrator, friends, science journalists, that badmouth these women. 
And uh, they do this in books, in referee reports, and interviews. In what these way? Are like they they say they didn't do it, or they just bad about their character, right? but they're not. They're bad people, it. yeah, right. And they uh, well, uh, claim things that are not real, and uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the status quo. Uh, they want to cling to the status quo, and everybody who disturbs the status quo, there is something wrong with it, and. Um, uh, when I submitted my grant proposal, uh, they were attacked and I was attacked for wanting to study them. So <laughs> there is a, there are individuals with a vested interest not to disturb the status quo. So you should be aware of that too. Uh, Nina. Yes. Uh, can you call, I mean, can you call their names who they are? I mean. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get to that. Okay, right. <laughs> and uh, all the flyers that you have, they are named there too. I know it, but I, 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 it would, it would just help your, your, your talk if you just, you're talking about so few people. It would be good to just right. know who you're talking about. Yeah, right. Now, uh, let me see. Okay, so maybe uh, this uh, slide goes to Ken's suggestion. Uh, we have a situation that the women that uh, made the discovery uh, and were the first co-authors uh, conducted their career in uh, geographical areas that I call them the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> and um, I mean University of Texas or the Deep South, University of Alabama, and uh, by contrast, the men uh, spend all their time in uh, greater Boston or greater New York. Now, I don't need to elaborate on the, on the difference between these geographies, even for people who are not from the United States. And uh, you don't need to know uh, political science to realize that people are exiled to remote location when they are perceived to present a threat to a particular regime. This is what uh, they did in Europe or in uh, Russia during Tsar time. Everybody was a threat. People like Rosa Luxemburg, they were exiled or if they're smart enough, they, ex they escaped on their own. So people are put in locations that those that the center don't care what happens there. So there is a, a big geopolitical disparity between um, the careers and the lives of these people. Um, now, uh, when we try to see what is the reason for the invisib invisibility of the lead co-authors, um, we can think of uh, gender bias, you can think of, uh, in the case of today, because I'm talking about women from East and South Asia, that uh, there is a component of uh, race bias, but as always in science, there is a problem of competition between institutions and especially between their star scientist directors. There is also a problem that the Nobel selection process is opaque. And sometimes they may be more concerned with balancing the power between alpha male uh, sponsors than uh, to find who did what. Uh, as I said, they don't even know if the discovery was made independently. So we talk now about the topic of today. We focus on two uh, women scientists. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Luis Chao. And uh, if I can go back, I can, uh, I'll show to you the photos in a moment. Um, I focus today on Luis Chao and Saida uh, Bakhtiari Zain. Uh, 
from east from east and uh, south asia and uh, both of them were born to upper class families in government employment uh, following the drastic political changes in those regions in the late 1940s uh, you know what happened in the late 1940s in 49 China turned communist and uh, people who are not happy about it moved to Taiwan. Uh, this is the case of Chow's family. And um, uh, Zane, uh, her maternal grandfather, served at the court of the Nizam, who ruled the princely state of Hyderabad until 1948 when it was annexed to India and the family moved to Karachi, Pakistan, but later on split between India, Pakistan, United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, Hyderabad was a rich, uh, powerful and uh, large state the size of UK and was considered to have the best government in India. Uh, I'm going to show you now where these places are. So uh, this is uh, Hunan province from which Louis Chow came. And you can see that it's relatively close to Taiwan. Uh, so I suppose somebody on the border with Mongolia might have more difficult time, but from Hunan it was relatively easy to, uh, to relocate. And uh, this is more or less the trajectory of uh, Louis Chow from Hunan to Taiwan and then to Caltech at Los Angeles and then to two places in New York State, uh, Cold Spring Harbor and University of Rochester and then where she is now uh, and uh, uh, University of Alabama. Now about uh, Saida Zain, She's from Hyderabad. This is a, a, a city uh, in uh, South India, uh, founded in 1591. Uh, and um, it, 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 and the, the population at that time and the founders were Muslim. So uh, this why the name of the city is Charminar, which means four minarets, you see. And here is the trajectory of Saida uh, Zain. If Louise had a tra trans-Pacific relocation, she had a transatlantic because she came from Hyderabad, then Karachi, then Glasgow, United Kingdom, then Yale, New Haven, and um, uh, she remained for the rest of her life in Rochester, New York. So uh, both women arrived in the United States to pursue, PA, uh, to pursue advanced studies. Chow arrived uh, to do a PhD in chem chemistry at Caltech, and she became a student of Norman Davidson, who was a collaborator uh, and uh, chair of department and uh, some kind of successor of Linus Pauling. So if you talk about scientific lineage, you cannot do much better than what she had. She specialized in advanced biophysical technique, especially electron microscopy, microscopy in molecular biology. Uh, Saida Zain arrived in 72 to do postdoctoral studies at Yale in the lab of Sherman Weissman after she completed PhD at the University of Glasgow in UK. Both, with many others, arrived at Cold Spring Harbor in 1975 as advanced postdocs. This is a photo of uh, Louise Chow that you could only see her with the electron microscope and 
a very beautiful dog, but I could not find the dog recently. So believe me, uh, they had, the dog is no longer with us, but uh, this is how she spent a lot of her time, which is very good because the dog barked when once in her uh, time at Cold Spring Harbor, the director came to the office, so she was well protected there. So as you can see, Louise was the first author of the discovery paper from Cold Spring Harbor, and uh, she had three men as uh, co-authors. Uh, so as I said, her contribution was to um, be able to locate and measure uh, uh, the location of the M mRNA uh, segments in visually compelling images and uh, this uh, was crucial because the community was not prepared at that time to accept our, uh, splicing on the basis of biochemical evidence only. Now, uh, on her side, look at her photo and not at the publication because I'm not uh, talking now about, uh, I will talk later about her publications. Um, Saida was uh, part of a large team at Cold Spring Harbor and uh, one of only two women that uh, were involved with the discovery at that time and place. Her main contribution uh, related to being a uh, acquiring special expertise at Yale in sequencing. And she specialized in sequencing junction of hybrid viruses. And uh, what is more important that they put at the bottom that uh, her data clearly showed that uh, captoligos, this means a cap of messenger RNA was not possibly encoded adjacent to the fiber gene. And this is, in a way, the discoveries that the cap and the messenger come from different locations on the genome. And then the question is, how this can possibly happen? Now, uh, here, uh, when we talk about gender and race, um, how, how are they involved? Uh, gender and race did not intervene in uh, Chow and Zane having careers. Both became full professors at the University of Rochester. Saida Zane remained there, becoming a prolific inventor, uh, sadly dying prematurely of cancer at age 69 in 2012. Uh, Chow moved from Rochester to Birmingham, Alabama uh, for a bigger lab, and she was elected belatedly to membership with the U.S. National Academy of Science in 2012. So uh, the question here is uh, how gender and race affected um, if they were... Uh, if they affected the recognition for the discovery and not uh, their ability to survive in science, which, uh, as I said, they were able to survive. So now I'm uh, talking about uh, strategies of uh, marginalization that uh, uh, affected these two uh, uh, women, but uh, you should remember that these strategies affected other people, including uh, uh, young uh, men and, uh, non, uh, and other women. Uh, one strategy was that uh, the director of Cold Spring Harbor uh, decided because uh, several scientists were involved that the institution, not individuals, deserves the credit. 
So if uh, uh, women were first or middle or other quarter, nobody should receive credit, but the institution and under these circumstances where you have a very famous director saying that the credit should go to the institution, uh, it's very difficult to um, to argue with him. And sadly, uh, at that time, uh, most of the uh, people there uh, would not argue. Uh, what happened is that the people were forced to publish an internal paper in alphabetical order, so to uh, blur uh, the order of who did what. And uh, in addition, for external publication, they had to wait for a student of the director to complete some experiment and publish solo, where everybody else had to publish as a co-author. So uh, all these uh, manipulations created a situation uh, that, first of all, uh, Cold Spring Harbor lost priority altogether because the MIT group used the fast track and published a bit earlier. And second, it became very unclear uh, uh, what really happened with the discovery. Then there are individual strategies for marginalizing, and this means that someone is targeted specifically, while the previous strategy Everybody was marginalized because uh, the idea was to credit the institution. And this strategy is very common in many communal society. Uh, I must say some in which uh, people like Hava and I also grew in, that the collective is elevated on top and uh, you are supposed to give credit to the unit, whether it's in society or in the army and not to anybody uh, not to an individual identity. However, individual marginalizing is when somebody is targeted. So to make a long story short, uh, at the time of the discovery, Saida uh, was applying for citizenship because her entire family, not her entire, some of her family was uh, trying to settle in the US. We are talking about the late 70s, and, the, and they all succeeded. But uh, as you know, when uh, your uh, immigration status is being processed, and I'm not talking about what happens today uh, with the disasters at the border, but even if you are processed in a decent way, it takes um, about a year or more, and during that time, uh, you cannot apply for grants in your own names. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's not a good idea even to get out, to leave the country because you may have difficulties to re-enter. So uh, she worked in a lab that belonged to someone else. That someone else was Robert J. Roberts, uh, Richard J. Roberts, and uh, was dependent because he had the right to put his name on everything she published, even though most of her publication, uh, she remained first uh, co-author. Um, but in this case, uh, what happened was that uh, Roberts did not want to confront Watson, who uh, was the director or other powerful scientists, and told the students to drop Saida as co-author and to publish solo, because if he publishes solo, and you are a PhD student, the credit goes to your advisors usually. I don't know, maybe today uh, juniors have more rights. At that time, it was obvious that credit will go to the advisor. So this was an, another way for those uh, lab directors to get credit. Uh, she felt very bad about it. And um, I... Uh, we interviewed uh, one of her nephews to whom she was particularly close. And you can see from this quote uh, how she felt uh, that she considered 
uh, Roberts to be like a brother and she felt betrayed and uh, it was like a slap in the face and she decided to leave shortly after which was the right decision and uh, left for a university where people were willing to treat her for her real scientific value. I hope you are able to read because it's a very beautiful quote. Now, uh, Luis Chao was also uh, individually targeted, even though she was also part of the collective targeting. Uh, the same uh, Roberts was her co-author uh, for the discovery paper, as you remember from a previous slide. Now, uh, you people um, try not to choose your enemies uh, from people who have many assets because it's going to be difficult uh, when they come against you. So what happened here, he had many assets uh, compared to other co-authors. He was more veteran. He was very adept at befriending the difficult director, uh, J.D. Watson, who preferred to surround himself with Brits. And uh, Maybe you'll ask a question is a Q and A why he liked Brits, and uh, he also switched his research interests to uh, uh, to restriction enzymes and built libraries. So he is distributing uh, these ma uh, much needed libraries. You cannot uh, do genome mapping without them. Uh, for free to many scientists who became indebted and grateful and were willing to listen to whatever he had to say. So given his uh, uh, position, he had many invitations to speak at important conferences. He took the opportunity to share the news before publication and he highlighted his own contribution while minimizing Louise's uh, unique uh, role in providing the discovery proofs, which, as I said, would have never been accepted just on the basis of what Roberts had to offer or anyone else in biochemistry. Um, there is also a problem here that uh, Louise Chow, either because she was, uh, she believed in Confucian philosophy uh, she believed that her works uh, uh, that her work spoke for itself and needed no special touting. Well, this is a very noble uh, attitude in a context of uh, competition when somebody floats an alternative narrative, uh, not. Uh, not uh, not providing a counter narrative might be difficult because uh, most people go after gossip or after uh, what they hear and uh, also many people are uh, influenced by the zero sum game the discovery was actually a collaboration between robert's lab who prepared the fragments and louise who uh, use them to map uh, the segments of uh, mRNA and it is best described as a collaboration but because of the zero sum game perception uh, and also because many other people try to associate themselves with the discovery Roberts felt that he had to uh, magnify his place and he portrayed himself as a theoretician. He had a, an idea, but the idea was wrong and she refuted it. And um, she, he referred to her as a mere experimentalist and uh, that EM was a microscopy or something that any other operator could do, which was not true. You needed absolutely special skills. 
to do the discovery and um, as a result um, uh, his narrative was corrosive for her uh, standing. Uh, so, as I said, given the absence of a counter narrative, even though his uh, uh, Robert's narrative was self serving uh, and other people didn't care about her or about they everybody cared to expand their own modest roles uh, and given the gender bias was obvious at the time, and uh, I presume it's fair to say that race bias was too. Uh, if you had the choice to think if a tall male scientist is a British accent who long cultivated many scientists by supplying enzyme, uh, restriction enzymes in high demand and frequently repeated a well-rehearsed narrative that match prevailing biases, both scientific and social, uh, people were more likely to believe that he and not a petite, quiet Asian woman uh, who supplied no counter narrative was the discoverer. <laughs> Even her own <laughs> PhD advisor. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm entering. Uh, I'm just uh, having a, a ringer here at this at the, uh, 12.59. Um, you wanted to have a reminder of time. I don't know what Yeah, right, your... right, right. I do. And, it's so uh, interesting. You right. want to take like three minutes to finish or? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, in a way I finish and now uh, uh, our, uh, our challenge is this year is the 30th anniversary of the Nobel, which excluded uh, Louis Chow uh, and uh, also the woman from MIT who was the first uh, co-author, but the woman from MIT was not an independent scientist. So this is a separate issue. Some people, uh, I was screamed at by many women scientists. She was only a postdoc, uh, but Louis Chow was independent scientist. So this is the best case study that nobody can scream that uh, can scream about because uh, all the everything that you need to come uh, against uh, there is a good answer. So the question is, uh, what can we do? to persuade um, those in charge to uh, restore justice and give recognition to the people who deserve it uh, and not to those who uh, deserve a part of it, but not uh, at the level that they got because alone they did nothing. And uh, it's uh, it's really a major item of injustice. Um, at that time, I must say, unlike today, gender and race and cultural diversity were not considered important issues. And now that we are more aware of these issues, maybe we can uh, uh, think together how we can help to restore uh, that type of justice. And... Uh, here for conclusions, more transparency, uh, more policy. So when prizes are recognized, we need to hear from every co-author, not only from two. The Nobel Committee did not ask for CVs from other uh, co-authors, ask only for two that were nominated by very uh, powerful people who had a vested interest in nominating those two, who, as I said, did absolutely nothing alone. And uh, to conclude, these are my acknowledgements. And I'm sorry if uh, not, I hope I included everybody. So we can move to questions and Hafa will uh, uh, moderate the questions. Really uh, amazing talk. It's a very wonderful. So let's see. I see that Judith has a question. Judith, would you like to open your microphone and share it?
I believe Judy had to leave the meeting. Okay, so let's see. She said the one thing I might point out is that Southern institutions such as universities and Richards hospitals in the 1970s were purposely being built up during the time by the federal government and also by oil money in Texas. I lived in Alabama during that period and many high level scientists and researchers were actively recruited to come to these institutions. So I would not necessarily label those lo locations as being exiled from East and West Coast powerhouse universities. Just one other possibility explanation about locales. Thanks, but I have to leave now. Okay, so she had to leave. I didn't read No, that's, uh, uh, that's true, but the move to the South was in the 90s, not in the 70s. But the point is, uh, not uh, a lot of uh, men scientists tell me Maybe they wanted to go there. No, they wanted to go to Colombia where they interviewed. And, uh, you know, yeah. they, try, they think that uh, people are stupid. And they we yeah. all know the geographical hierarchy and other hierarchies. And yeah. that's very yeah. assuring that I check the people where they wanted to be. Totally, totally. Yeah. You Benina. know, I think... Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, <clears throat> hello? Panina? Yes? Uh, you asked what should we do or what can we do? Yeah, right. Given that. And what I think we need to do is get the story out in a very compelling way. Right. We don't need to uh, ask for justice. I think, I think that will be forthcoming. I think what has happened is people don't even know the story. Mm -hmm. And if we can get the story out in a way that it really uh, is disseminated to a large group of people, I think that will be a major accomplishment. That's correct. And I think I'm, now that I completed the bulk of the research, I hope to write the book and then... Uh, you know, you can but dump even, even, even before you complete the book, there are ways you can foreshadow the book. You can you you can you can get major stories out in in uh in in, 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 in magazines and presses before the book itself comes out, and I think. It is timely for that to happen. I mean, within the year, for example, you 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 know the story well enough that you can create a narrative that is very compelling. And the reason I say that is because when we last talked, you told me about it. I did not know the story, and I asked some people at MIT, and. They seem to think that, oh, that, that's been settled and this and that and so forth. And uh, I've never heard of it. And I think you would do a great service to uh, to get that story out in front of a lot of people. Uh, that's true. But, uh, you know, when I published, uh, there is a paper in American Scientists in 2020, which has the photo of the six women. And um, I wrote a letter to the editor why they didn't put the six women on the cover. Because if you had such a photo on the cover, uh, most photos of women are uh, uh, of individuals and uh, six uh, is a number that attracts attention. And uh, instead they put a wild dog from Australia on the cover. Uh, this was their preference, and uh, it, it's difficult. And uh, they were kind to publish my letter, but and a lot of people, some uh, say, well, a lot of uh, readers like dogs, and it's not uh, so easy to, uh, um, you you know, to uh, pr um, promote certain things that run against, I mean, even Einstein says that it's more difficult to crack social bias than to crack the atom. And- uh, Yeah, but I think, I think now is the opportune time. I think 
people are are publishing things. For example, the Globe just published, uh, you know, in the last couple of days, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, huge pieces on on the Whitehead and what has happened there and so oh. forth and so on. So I, you know, I think I think we have to look for for various forms of publication, magazines, New York Times Magazine, New Yorker, things like that. I think we have to uh, extend our purview beyond just scholarly uh, journals. And this is so important that it would capture the public's interest. You are no doubt right, and I, I'll do my best. And if people have suggestions, I'll be happy to. But I want to tell you that uh, I spoke with members of the Nobel committees that made the mistaken assignment, and they are aware of that. And maybe the strategy is to put pressure there. I don't know. Uh, they are aware that uh, uh, they made a mistake. They, they are under pressure from very powerful figures. And, uh, uh, you know, I it will be good is, to show to everybody that come from your be corrected. The pressure is going to come from your publication and getting, right. getting the press and you know, a popular uh, journals to to, to uh, carry this story because it is a very very important story. Thank you, Ken. You. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, we hear Hello, you. Hello, I'm, I'm Ludwig Pfeiffer from Germany, an old hey. friend of, of Nina, but we haven't seen each other for many, many years, maybe 40 years by now. Wow. Uh, so, Nina, thank you for your talk. If the Nobel Committee is going to reevaluate that process about RDA and so forth, uh, is it possible that they should also make new inquiries into the the uh, into the role of male researchers who were at a disadvantage i'm thinking yes yes there are about, yes about Shargaf, for instance right <laughs> uh, ludwig and i try to write a play about uh, a scientist, this time male, uh, Erwin Chargaff, who was also screwed, and uh, two other <laughs> individuals who did uh, unimportant things were included. And uh, it's uh, these things are not easy, but maybe mm -hmm. the the Nobel Committee had a few scandals recently, so they feel uh, more edgy now. <laughs> so maybe you can shake the three better, uh, they are aware and some of them are sympathetic. So, uh, you know, we, we need, and the public opinion will play a role. And here where all of you come, if, you know, we decide to go for a, some kind of a campaign at some point, um, uh, we'll need a lot of people to sign or to say something and uh, we'll be very happy if you mobilize your own networks because uh, it, it is a definite possibility for them to, uh, they have a few cases that um, if nobody stands for you, it's very difficult. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or if you're not nominated, there is a case in 2004 where uh, three men <clears throat> got the Nobel and one of the men was the advisor of another, and he said, uh, my advisee does not reserve the prize because he followed my orders. He didn't do anything. Uh, the, but uh, the advisee, uh, who was younger, apparently was well connected to others, and the Nobel Committee didn't listen to the advisor, and he was included. So it is possible to... <laughs> Uh, but you have to be active. If you if you sit and let the status quo prevail, nothing will happen. 
So, you know, it's very, it's very interesting, you know, um, do we have uh, just someone like is everybody here? Yeah, Gail, you know, there is something interesting. Um, there was a big discussion in, in the field, in our field of neural networks. There is a Turing Award that was just given to three people that have done some some uh, serious work in neural networks. But I think that many other people think that others uh, have done more fundamental and earlier work in in neural networks. I'm just mentioning it, Gail, because I was thinking about your husband when I heard about them getting, and I was thinking, just a second, you know. Now, this is a allocation of credit is the most complicated issue, uh, and this is not the only case uh, that is problematic. Uh, but as I said, th there are sins of omission and there are sins of commission. There yeah. are people who are pushed by other powerful ones and yeah. their role is really marginal and others who are. It depends yeah. on the power structure at the time. And my point for you is that if we want to participate in restoring justice instead of sitting and doing nothing, is to explore what is the best way to uh, help in this case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But we, kn we know these things are all very political and some people get farther with it than others. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, uh, but in this field of, which is not mine, the, the DNA field, I mean, there are previous cases that were ignored, Rosalind Franklin, of course, and also the two women who were really responsible for CRISPR. And I remember early when a colleague heard about, this is a few years ago, the pending lawsuit for the patent on CRISPR. And I didn't know anything other than what I'd read in the newspaper. I had absolutely no inside, but he said, when when he said, well, there are the, the two women and then there's MIT. I said, MIT is gonna get it. it it's, I, I don't know anything else, but, but yeah. they got the Nobel prize and they got the book about them and so on. So in a way they got the last laugh, but MIT got the money, you know, yeah. Uh, no, but uh, you see the point about in this case, and Ken is here, a member of MIT. Um, they had uh, one of the women lead co authors was from MIT at the time of the discovery, but she uh, but she left no, them for, yeah. I'm, for I'm thinking of the what she could find a job. They they made a nomination without her, which means that they don't even care about what happened in a discovery. They had two people from MIT that could have been nominated. And usually this is what they should have done. It's the first and the last, because sometimes uh, lab directors so they, play a role. But, you know, in this case, they didn't care even to nominate their own person who was at the time a woman. Yeah. I, I, see, I think yeah. these things are, are very embedded in our culture and my attitude is I'm not going to let it, you know, the disappointments ruin my life. And I'm not going to certainly not going to spend my life trying to run after things that aren't uh, going to change. And and one of the things, the strengths of women is as a group, this is a gross oversimplification, but the women I know personally have a lot of other sources of satisfaction in their life other than you know, the prizes and the recognition, they both professional satisfaction for having done the work, whether or not anybody knows about it, and also a lot of other personal satisfaction. Um, and uh, I, I think that's something to hold on to and not give up. So this notion of leaning in, that, that really bothered me. Like, oh, we're all supposed to lean in and get all these goodies that we're not getting. But you also lose some things when, when that becomes your object in life. No, but yeah, I, 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 I can reassure you. 
Yeah, go I ahead. Don't think, I don't think Panine or anyone is saying that all women should do that. There are women who Oh, are, I, I know she's not. I didn't say that. No, but there, but there are people who are comfortable mm -hmm. with your position, and they should take your position. I, I can't say I'm comfortable with it. I'm just saying it's an acknowledgement of... Oh, yeah, they the are women. As it is. And there are women who are even opposed, who, who really don't do... Who, who are really against women. Right. There are those who really want women to have equitable justice at all levels, and they ought to be a... They ought to pursue that as well. So... You know, there is a diversity of political right. stances that people can take. And 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 I think there's nothing wrong in mobilizing the people who are trying to seek well, justice at all levels. I know. I mean, you if you knew my life, you would know that I No, no, I, no. I'm not this isn't personal. many decades doing these things and trying to help all everybody who's deserving. Um, and so well, on. I'm just saying, I know women, and maybe you do too, who basically sacrifice and try to go after these things and give up some of these other important values. And they're basically not very happy. Oh, no, I, I know that too. Yeah, you're right. Go That's all I'm saying. I'm no, not no, saying it's fair or right. I'll, or I'll say it stronger than you've said it. There are women who try to go after these things and are miserable, but they will prefer that misery to the happiness because that's where they are, you know. Oh, in, is Miss Ian still here? Because I see she wrote something in the in the um, chat at eight fifteen, at one fifteen. I think she left. Ooh. Yeah, I I think she left. Interesting suggestion. Yeah, right. This is so. Um, I think that Jen also has something to say. Yeah. So now it's eight nineteen. We're a little bit over time, but it's okay. Uh, let's give it like three more minutes, like yeah. Jane and you know whoever wants, and then Penina back. I would, yeah, I would like. I would like to speak to the last two comments. Having led a class action lawsuit against a government laboratory for their disparity in how they were treating women scientists and promoting them and paying them. And although we settled, there was a settlement and I went, really wanted to go to court. I had some absolutely fantastic attorneys. We did settle out of court, but I have many friends who've gone individually up against the organization and the organization destroys you. Yeah. And I, I had so much health effects. It's amazing the effects on women's health because they, yeah. will, they will just destroy you as an individual. Yeah. So I will tell you that as a group, as a class action suit, we came out on top and Lawrence Livermore Lab has now appointed this last year's first woman director of the laboratory. I take full credit for that. Wow. <laughs> okay. I, I know only cases of a woman alone against institute and they have no, they don't oh, stop. They, it, they want to ruin you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Jane and Neslian? Yeah. Yeah, so this mm -hmm. is a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. I, um, I just wanted to make a comment, um, maybe a couple comments, but um, about the Nobel Prize itself, as I'm sure all of you are aware the Nobel Prize will only award be awarded other than the Peace Prize to three individuals. And so the fight for who these three individuals were going to be for the splicing discovery was, you know, incredible. Um, because basically you had Louise Chow, you have um Suzanne um Berger. Berger, yes. Um, and then you've got Rich Roberts and you've got Phil Sharp. And of course there are other people as well. Um, and you know, a lot of the fault of this lies, I think, based on my research and my interviews actually with Jim Watson himself, 
<laughs> um, and surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, so that's comment number one is there was a huge constraint, you know, on who could be awarded the prize and everybody was waiting for Jim Watson to make his declaration ex cathedra and, you know, um, and of course, MIT had to be included in some way in this. Um, the other right. thing I'll say is there's no way the Nobel Prize Committee is going to retroactively change their decision, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. opinion. <laughs> so yeah, if you want justice to be served in some way, um, it's going to have to be outside the Nobel. Um, yeah. Um, That's a good point. Uh, Neslia? <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that maybe everything is about uh, how we look at the things. Uh, do we actually need that much hours or something? Well, most of the time we are just happy that we have the chance to work on. Uh, for example, from where I am, I, I think I'm just uh, uh, like uh, in a very far away place where almost nobody cares about anything, but still we do work because we are just happy to understand something at least, even though what we did will never be read by anyone because you see, it's, it's just from a very unprivileged place we are. I mm -hmm. think we shouldn't get stuck with the hours that much, but maybe just try to give people hope that they can still have chance to work on what they want to work, to work on what they want to learn and so on. Maybe we have to change our view a little bit. That's, that's, a, that's a very scientific a point of view and I share it with you because I am basically a scientist and it doesn't, doesn't usually matter about the recognition because I love my day-to-day -day work. And and yet we know there's someone like a Rosalind Franklin who has done such incredible work, and only through the court of public opinion do people now know who she is and think of her as one of the great yeah. scientists of the 20th century. Thank goodness so, for you historians of science. That's interesting. So, uh, and Pena, we bring it, Miriam, I'm not trying to be not... Oh, it's uh, fine. It's no, fine. I'm, I'm just, I, we just need to, to correct. Uh, Pena, you want to say the last word? Yeah, I, well, um, there is not only uh, the perspective of uh, not recognizing women. Uh, like uh, Mary Virginia said, uh, uh, Suzanne Perger takes a point. She doesn't care about the Nobel. She doesn't, uh, she had the gratification of making the discovery, which is thrilling, which she described in detail, which uh, the men who, who got, they cannot give you such a description because they didn't make any discovery. So uh, there are people who, you know, like you interview uh, participants in a robbery and one was a driver, he cannot tell you what happened in the bank because he remained outside. So <laughs> you, you need to, to see. So the, there are people who uh, indeed are... Uh, um, are satisfied that they had the opportunity to uh, participate in that and so on. But you also have to think what are the ramifications for science that the wrong people get such major uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, the two people who got, uh, uh, who are part of the Nobel for DNA, uh, Wilkins and Watson, uh, I investigated this for a long time. Uh, please believe me, what they did is not uh, uh, very relevant to the to what happened there, and um, in the case of uh, uh, of RNA splicing, it's the same. They were part of a picture. They're doing other things, but uh, as as they stand alone, they they are not the right choices. So, what are the ramifications if you have somebody? Uh, slightly elevated to the top, that it's like a it's like a fake uh, uh, individual. It's very bad because these individuals have the right to select others, and they always live in. They are very evasive. 
they are not, they, they don't talk because as I said, like in the robbery, they are not there, they cannot tell you what happened. So mm -hmm. it, it creates an atmosphere which is not good if uh, people uh, are put in such positions as symbols of science that don't belong there. So uh, it's not just taking from women, it's just putting there the wrong uh, candidates. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. We'll stop here. It's very touching and I'm sure we all kind of have a lot of feeling and thought about it and, and it's there. There is unfairness and there's unfairness in science too that is sometimes really kind of, you know, whatever it's true, we try to do other things and to think about other things, but there is something there that something happened that was not right. But I think, thank you so much. Thank you, Pnina, very well, much. Thank you. You are, you are a thank superb you, audience. For organizing I could not, this I could not have had a better audience and many thanks to everybody who came. And thank, thank you, you, Katie.